guys. Um, so today I want to talk to you about the Mix It Up bracelet. The Mix It Up bracelet is actually a bracelet I've had around for quite a while, but I've never done a video on it. Um, it was one of my paid projects, meaning that you paid for the instruction or the kit on jillwisemandesigns.com. And uh, recently I decided to make this one of my free patterns. So now you can actually go to jillwisemandesigns.com, click on free patterns, and you will find the Mix It Up bracelet available to download for free. But I still didn't have any video. So today we're gonna fill in that spot with a video on it. But one of the biggest reasons why I'm excited to make this video is because, well, there's actually a couple reasons. One is because this project um, in general, not the Mix It Up specifically, but this project in general was one of the very first bead projects I ever taught. When I was learning to be a teacher at the Nomadic Notions, which was the local bead store in Austin at the time, and that's where I learned how to be a bead teacher. Uh, and so back then, what I was calling this was a treasure bracelet. And that is what I consider this overall project to be, is a treasure bracelet. Mix It Up just happens to be a specific type of bead being used on this treasure bracelet. But the reason I call it a treasure bracelet is because you can use all sorts of treasures on top for the embellishment on this bracelet and it will look so different every time you make it. And so it is super fun to play with. It's a great thing to use your leftover beads uh, for. And let me kind of bring you in closer here and I wanna show you an array of just some of the treasure bracelets that I have made over the years. So this is, a, a pile of all the treasure bracelets that I could find. Now I have probably made, I'm gonna guess 30 treasure bracelets over the years. And so this is just, you know, what I have left right now. These ones right here on, on the side, these are the ones that are specifically mix it up. And the reason that these are specifically mix it up is because all of the embellishment on the top is using six millimeter pearls. Um, or in this case, there's actually Drux in here instead of pearls. So these ones are, both of these were made with Swarovski pearls. This one was made with Drux, which is just a round bead, but they're all six millimeter in size. So it gives it a very specific look. But over here, you can see that you can use all sorts of beads on top. Um, these three guys were all, all made with freshwater pearls, different types, different shapes. Uh, you can, you know, um, really mix the sizing and the other big difference between like these three and these three is that on these three the loops that i used to attach each one of the pearls had a couple of extra seed beads on either side meaning that these loops are a little bit more flexible and floppy there's more movement in these guys where this one, I left those loops very close to the base. Here's a look at the base. This is a square stitch base. This particular one uses size six seed beads. And so I left these nice and tight and it makes it more densely packed where these have more movement. And then this one has even more movement still. So this one is a combination of freshwater pearls. There's some fire polish in there and then some rose quartz chip beads. This is a great use for those chip beads. And uh, so this one had yet more seed beads in each one of those loops, which gives it a lot more of that kind of flirty, fringy, fun flair to it. Um, this guy was kind of actually the inspiration for the mix it up ver variation. This one is using all freshwater pearls, but I did it, again, this packed more densely. I made the loops much smaller here, and I used all the same size pearl. In this case, it was a five millimeter, roughly five millimeter uh, freshwater pearl. And then this one is the last variation that I have sitting right here, and this one is literally all seed bead loops. This is just a size 11 seed bead mix, and just picked it randomly, and they are just, a series of loops that gives you this very caterpillar kind of look to it, um, which is very cool. Another difference between the mix it up variation and these guys over here is that here we use the six uh, size six seed beads for the base. And here I'm just picking one that I think you're gonna be able to see it really well. Here, 
it's the same number of beads across, but I used size eight seed beads instead of size sixes. So it's not quite as wide, it's just a little bit more narrow. Um, and if you don't have sixes, there's absolutely no reason why you can't use eights for the base. So that's why this particular treasure bracelet concept gives you so many ways to play with it. And no matter what beads you have at home, I guarantee you, you can put one of these together. One of the options here that I don't, I don't have um, a sample of anymore is it's very much like this uh, with all fire polish. There's fire polish in it. There's shaped beads like little heart beads, um, little uh, stars, um, just basically all those leftover beads that you have from projects. I just made a color assortment uh, that pleased me. Oh, the flowers and leaves look amazing in this bracelet. So you can definitely put flowers and leaves in here. Um, I would say that you don't want to go any bigger than a six millimeter in general. Like some of, uh, every once in a while in this particular version, I've got some eight, that, well, they look closer to an eight millimeter. It's probably a seven or eight millimeter. But notice that I only put them in randomly. You know, you're just kind of trying to balance that out a little bit. Um, one of the reasons, though, I don't suggest using a lot of beads that are bigger and is because it makes your bracelet heavier. Um, and that's one thing that I will say about the Mix It Up variation is that it is quite heavy uh, because it is all six millimeter beads. And so you will definitely feel this on your wrist. Some people are kind of surprised by that. Now, it's a comforting weight. It doesn't, for me, it doesn't bother me. But if you are bothered by weight on your wrist, then this variation is probably not the way to go for you. You want to gun it go with some smaller beads for your embellishment. Okay, one last thing I wanna mention is your clasp choice on this project. And pardon the fact that these silver clasps are very tarnished. Um, I actually just found these in a, uh, <laughs> in a cabinet. Yesterday they've been sitting in the cabinet for like the last five years, so I didn't get a chance to polish them up before this video. But I used to always use a toggle clasp, and occasionally I would use a, a Biwa Pearl for the toggle. Um, but here's the downside of using a toggle clasp on one of these bracelets, and let me put one on here to kind of illustrate the point. Because of all of this embellishment, on the top of the bracelet. The top of the bracelet is your heaviest point. And your clasp area, come on, get on. It's like, hey, I've been in a cabinet for five years. I don't remember how to work. Well, evidently, I don't remember how to work you either. Good thing I don't carry this clasp anymore. It's kind of difficult to get in there. Oh, come on. OK, fine. I will use the other one because Evidently, I can't figure out how to get this one on, but I know that I can get this one on. Okay, so heaviest part is on top. But what happens when you wear a bracelet? You're, as you're moving and moving around and stuff, the light, the, all the heaviness wants to fall to the bottom of your wrist, and the lightest part wants to stay up at the top. And so what happens with these bracelets, if you're using something like this toggle clasp, is that your toggle always ends up on top. Now, if you've got a really pretty toggle, that's fine. Um, you could probably also embed this toggle underneath the bracelet so that it was a little bit more hidden. But again, that's kind of difficult. Or you could just do like what I would always do when I was wearing these and constantly be kind of moving that clasp back to the bottom of your wrist. So an improvement that I have made is it's actually one of the reasons why I kind of moved away from these treasure bracelets is because of that whole clasp issue. One of the improvements that I have made now with this is that I now use a slide clasp for these bracelets. So. While that's still a lighter part of your bracelet, it's a much smaller area, so it's not as noticeable. And what happens is it's not as light either because it's just a smaller segment where you're missing the heaviness of these beads here. Um, so that, and it also allows you to kind of 
make this, this clasp a little bit more tightly around your wrist. Basically, since I've switched to these uh, slide clasps for these bracelets, you don't have that problem where it's gonna slide down to the bottom of your wrist nearly as much anymore. I mean, it almost never happens when I'm wearing one of my samples. So that is a major suggestion for when you're making these bracelets is to use one of those slide clasps instead of something like a toggle clasp. Um, which is kind of a bummer because like I used to use really cool buttons for these. The buttons are really pretty. So, you know, there's, there's ways to troubleshoot it, but in general, the slide clasps are going to be your best option. Okay, so that's kind of the overview of the project. Now let me bring in my beading board and we can show you how this is actually made. Okay, so here we are with the board. And what you're going to need to make this, this uh, project is going to be um, either some size six or some size eight seed beads. In this case, I'm using sixes, bigger for you to see on camera. You're gonna want some size 11 seed beads for the loops. Uh, and I am going to be working on the mix it up variation. This is the colorway that I'm gonna work on here. Uh, these are some new Czech pearls that have come in, and I just loved the way that this color combo looked. So we're going to make a blue-green version. And so size 11 seed beads, size 6 beads for, seed beads for the base. Uh, in this case, I am using a two-hole uh, slide class for it. I actually already attached, man, I was getting ready for this video shoot. I already attached it on one end of this. Um, you can either use the two hole or you can use a three hole. Uh, all the other ones, I believe I used three hole clasps. Yeah, so two hole or three hole, either one will work. Um, I also wanted to point out that these are the regular slide clasps where the loops are oriented in this direction. You also could use the slide clasps with the vertical loops. So you'll just notice that the loops are pointed in a 90 degrees from the way these guys are. You can see these are flat. These, that same open circle look is showing this direction instead. So you can use either version for this particular project. Doesn't really matter. Okay, so what we're gonna start out with is doing some square stitch. And in this case, and actually in all of my bracelets, uh, treasure bracelets, I use five beads across. And one of the reasons I do this is because as I'm adding embellishment loops on top, I want an odd number of beads below because that will let me offset them, the offset the loops on top. So he, on one row, I would do the embellishment loops on the first, third, and fifth bead. And then on the next row, I would do embellishment lo loops on the second and fourth. So I'd go three and then two and then three loops and then two loops and do that all the way along so that it fills it in um, in a perfect manner so you're not leaving any big gaps or anything. Um, so odd number of rows is what you want. Uh, you could certainly do go down to a three row one. I've never, I don't think I've actually done a three row one ever. It, I, it may look a little too sparse. I don't know. You'd have to kind of try a little sample piece and see what it looked like. Um, and then if you were really a dramatic person, you could go to a seven row, a seven beads per, for each row instead of just using the five. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use a stopper bead. So let me go grab one of these pearls here and I will use one of the pearls as a stopper bead. I'm going to pull that bead down so that I've got about a four to six inch tail below it, enough so that I can weave that tail in later. In later. 
and then I pass from the bottom back up through that stopper bead again. And the thread is showing on the outside edge and that's what I want. It's totally fine because this bead is temporary. We're going to get rid of it later. Um, I'm going to go through like every step of this process in a way that I don't always because this treasure bracelet is the perfect beginner be, beginning bead weaver bracelet. And so I want to make sure that if you've never done any bead weaving before, you're going to be able to follow what's going on. Okay, so now we get to do square stitch. So we're going to pick up five beads for that first row. I'll bring them down so that they sit against that stopper bead. I'm going to kind of hold them vertically uh, and with the tail away from me. I'm going to pick up the first bead of the next row. What I'm going to do is this first bead of the next row is going to sit on top of this very first bead in this set of five here. We're going to pass through that bead from the outside edge, so away from my body. It's not the, the hole that's, that is, you're not going in the direction that's uh, towards, that's right next to my body. You're going to point your needle towards your body and go in that direction. And then as you pull your thread through, look, it just pops it right on top like a little soldier. Then you're going to pass your needle through that new bead you just added. And then tighten up. And if it doesn't snug up, like notice that there's a thread gap here between these beads and the stopper bead, that's totally fine. We're going to make it all sit the way we want to um, as we're stitching on this first row. This first row is always going to be your, your most difficult row. Okay, what on earth is going on here? Oh. It just doesn't want, it's trying not to sit on top of each other. Okay, there we go, like so. Then we're gonna pick up the next bead of your second row. Same thing, we're going on, on the opposite side of the bead, the next bead and pulling towards yourself. And you may have to kinda tug it a little bit, convince it to sit the way we want it to sit. The thread is gonna sit right in this intersection between these two beads. And then you're going to pass through the bead that you just added on that second row. And we're just going to keep doing this for each bead as we go along. So I picked up my new bead. I'm passing through the bead on the previous row towards me. Pulling my thread down. That thread can sit along that intersection, passing through the bead that I just added. While you're doing this, you're looking to make sure that your thread doesn't get hooked on any of these other beads because um, a hooked thread may show on the outside. And it can just cause beads to kind of sit funny. And now here we are, the last bead of this row, picking it up, going in from the opposite side towards yourself and back through the bead you just added. And there we are, we've got our very first two rows. That was the hardest part of this whole project. One of the things I love about square stitch is that there's a lot of reinforcing, which makes it a very strong uh, base for this to be on. And one of the things that you do at the end of every square stitch row is you pass your needle through all the beads of the previous row, and you don't hook your project that's sitting there. See, those hooked beads are a pain in the butt. Okay, let's get that out of the way. So all the beads of your previous row and then all the beads of the row you just finished. Then I like to flip this over so that I'm working in the same direction every time. At this point, we don't need this stopper bead anymore. Well, that was literally just to help us keep those beads from that first row from falling off the thread until it was all stitched in. So you can just pull that stopper bead off and get it out of your way. All right. And then I just like to keep my tail down and to the left. Let's do another row here together. So I'm picking up one. I am passing through that first bead from the opposite side towards myself. Getting it to sit right on top of the bead that you just passed through 
and then passing through that new bead. Picking up one, pass through the one below, pass through the bead you just added. If you're using size eights, it's gonna be just a smidge more difficult to get into each of these beads on the previous rows. Because we're using sixes, there's lots of give in here. It'll just be a slightly more um, compact to get in on those eights, but you can see that you can just get in with your needle. You just need kind of a little opening and then you can slide that bead in through the hole. I'm sorry, the needle in through the hole. And last bead of this row. And that's the end of our row. We're gonna do the reinforcing now. So we're gonna go back through all the beads of the previous row and all the beads of the current row and flip it over and we're ready to start again. So what's gonna happen as you keep adding rows, let me bring this other sample in, is you're gonna end up with a beautiful base that's kind of like this, except it'll be longer. And I had also made this base. This is a base that's done with all size uh, eight seed beads. So that can show you perfectly what a size difference there is in those bases. And I think we're gonna just keep going, working with the size six base. And we're gonna start doing loops. So I'm gonna bring in my embellishment beads and my size 11 seed beads. And here's a trick that I have learned over years and years and years of making these treasure bracelets, is that I actually like to put the, attach the clasp at this point before I've done any of the embellishing. Um, because it's just easier to kind of get in there to make these loops to attach your uh, clasp before there's all of this stuff to accidentally catch your thread on. So what I did here on this little sample is I came out between the first two beads on both the left and the right and created a loop of seed beads that hooked around the clasp loop. So that's what we're gonna do here. I'm gonna show you what to do with that. Uh, one other thing when I'm attaching these clasps, I like to make sure that they are closed. So I want both parts together and closed as I'm doing this. And the reason is, if you take these apart and you're only doing one, it's a little too easy to accidentally flip when you're doing the second side and accidentally attach it this way and now your class won't close because you goof that up. So to actually have the clasp closed so that you can make sure that you are orienting everything in the right direction makes a big difference. All right, so we need to get in position. Like I said, I wanted to be between the first and second beads on one of these two sides. So I can either back out of this one bead or these holes are nice and big in these size six seed beads. I can go back through the previous row and then just pass through a single bead on the outside row that I want. And now my thread is coming out between those first two beads and that's exactly where I want it to be. I'm going to pick up three seed beads. And these are the size 11 seed beads. And then I'm gonna pass through the first hole of the clasp. Now you're going to notice that most of these seed beads will actually, size 11 seed beads, I keep needing to, to differentiate here, um, will pass smoothly through that hole, but not all will. And so that's why I you have gotten in the habit of picking up the first three and then the clasp and then the second three, just in case you wind up with some that it doesn't work out that way. Um, then I'm going to pass back through these, between these two beads, I'm going to pass through the first, these next three seed beads um, on the base. 
to get in position for the second loop. So as that tightens down, now that is attached and we're in possession, position to add that second loop. So we'll pick up the three size 11s, pass through the second hole. I am not worrying about whether this is tight or not right now because we are going to go back and we are going to reinforce these loops. So I'm just trying to get everything connected and then we can worry about tightness. And then pick up the second three. Then I'm going to finish going through that row. All right, so that's basically what we've got going on there. Then now I'm going to use that previous row as a highway again to travel to where I want to be, which is back down here. And this is where we're not picking up any beads, we are simply reinforcing. So I'm going to pass through all these three beads on this side, go through the hole, catch the beads on the other side, watching for caught threads as I'm doing this. Then I can pass through those three beads on the base. And then we can reinforce this side as well. This guy, are you on the, this side or the other side? You're on the other side, okay. My rule of thumb with a clasp is that I know that clasps are the point that's going to get the most wear and tear as you wear your bracelet. And so I like to have three passes of thread minimum as I am reinforcing each clasp attachment. Um, now you can just go back and forth between these three beads on the end here and that's now my second pass of thread that I just did through there, and now I want to go back and do a third pass of thread. In a perfect world, I should also mention, because I've kind of gotten away from doing this, but it's probably a bad <laughs> habit of on mine, my end. Um, in a perfect world, you want to attach your clasp using a brand new length of thread. And the reason for that is if it's going to break, your bra bracelet is going to break, chances are it's going to be at that clasp. And if you put your clasp on with a brand new length of thread, then the only thing that broke was going to, is your clasp. Now, what I'm doing right here is I'm using the same thread that I used to create the base. And so I'm being bad <laughs> by doing that, which means that if this clasp area breaks and I need to go repair it, I'm also probably going to need to repair these last couple rows to make sure that these are not also going to start tearing out um, with that broken thread. If I had just used a brand new thread to attach these beads, uh, the clasp area, then the only thing that would have broken would, be, would have been these loops and I just would have needed to reattach the, the end. So it's one of those best practices versus, you know, reality kind of thing. It's up to you how you want to, uh, to whether you want to kind of take that little bit of, um, of uh, risk there. Okay, so now we want to finally get in place to start adding our first loop of embellishment. I, I like to, let's see, how do I like to work? Do I like to work on this? Yeah, I guess I work this way and I lay out things, uh, the loops as I add them, I lay them off to the left and work on the right side, but there's no reason why you can't orient this so that you're adding your loops on the right and laying them off to the right and working on the left side. So you lefties might be more comfortable that direction. But I'm going to go ahead and orient it this way. And I want to be coming out between the first two beads of the first row. Finally ready to start adding a loop. So I'm going to pick up four seed beads, the size 11 seed beads. That's all we're working with now. And then I'm going to pick up one of my embellishment beads. 
and four more of the size 11s. And I want this first loop to be over the very first bead of this row. So since I'm coming out um, on the side that's closest to me, I'm going to go back in on the opposite side, and I'm going to move forward as I pull the as I pull push my needle through by two more beads. So I'm passing through three beads there as I do that. Basically, what you're doing when you're creating these loops is voila just like that it's just a loop of seed beads around one of these base beads and we're going to do it on the first bead the third bead and the fifth bead of each of this first row the reason i popped through two beads was because i want to be on the opposite side of the bead on the base so i want to be close on the side closer to me so that when i attach that loop, I'm in perfect position to be able to also move forward to the next bead on the base that I want to be at. So here we are, we're going to pick up four seed beads, another embellishment bead. Random is so hard for me. I hit sit here and analyze random, but I do it. Uh, so four more seed beads. Now I'm coming in on the opposite side of that bead that I'm coming out of now and then passing forward so that I'm coming out the, the last bead on that row. So there's loop two. And then same thing. One, two, three, four, and a accent bead. Four more seed beads. And then I'm going to pass through that bead that I'm exiting. So I have to go in the opposite side so that I can make that loop. When I'm pulling these loops, super important to make sure it's not getting hooked up on any of these other loops that you've got going on here. At this point, you can push these loops off to the, to the side. In my case, it's the left side. And now on this next row, I want to do, I want to add my loops to beads two and four. So we're offsetting these. So there'll be three loops on one row and then two lo loops on the next row. So in this case, I want to, again, go past the bead that I want the loop to be on. So I want it, the, the bead to be on the second loop. Or I mean, on this, I'm sorry, the loop to be on the second bead. Got that mixed up. Uh, so I want to make sure that I'm gone past that second bead. I'm picking up my four seed beads and an embellishment bead and four seed beads. And now I'm going in the opposite side that I, of the bead that I'm already coming out of. And then I'm moving forward so that I'm coming out of that fourth bead there. So I'm in position now to add another loop. One, two, three, four. An embellishment bead. One, two, three, four. Then I'm going back in that same bead I'm exiting, but in the opposite, starting in the opposite side. Making my loop. And there we go. So you've got your three loops here and two loops here. And you push them off to the side. And you can see how it fills in perfectly without gaps for those rows. Then we're going to do the exact same thing. So we've just done that row. Now we're ready to position for the next row. And this is one where we're going to do three loops. So we're just going to pass through a single bead because we want that very first loop to be right here on the first bead of that row. Let's see here, come on little buddy. All right, 
So we are coming out on this side of that bead, so we're going to go in the opposite. And our next loop is going to be on the middle bead, so I want to be making sure that I've gone through that middle bead and I'm ready to add another loop. All right, so I want to talk to you about um, you're going to add these loops to every bead, uh, all of the rows. So three, two, three, two, the entire row, and then your bracelet's going to be done. And you can see how it really fills in as you're starting to add more and more embellishment beads. Um, two things. Square stitch is a very thread hungry project. So are these loops. So there's no way you're going to make this project with a single length of thread. So let me show you while, um, how I add an end thread uh, in square stitch. And I do have a separate video uh, to show you that also, so I will pop a link up for that. But here's how I do it right here where I've got all these loops and everything. One big thing, the reason I want to mention this, is I don't worry about going up, up and through these loops as I am getting ready to add or end thread. I do all of that adding and ending thread right there in the base with the square stitch. Now what I do like to do is leave my old thread. Let's pretend that this is too short to go forward anymore. You're, you want to add something new. I leave this old one until I've got the new thread attached. Because when I am attaching the new thread, I want to make sure that my thread is coming out of that same spot that this one is. And so if I end this off, I may think I'm going to remember exactly that right spot where that thread was, but trust me, you're going to forget at least 25 to 30 percent of the time. <laughs> and I tell you this from personal bitter experience. <laughs> so we're just going to leave that right there. Not going to worry about it. I'm going to grab a new thread here. I'm using my favorite six pound fire line on this project which is something new because back when I used to make these uh, treasure bracelets so often, it was actually before Fireline came on the market. So I used to be using um, colored thread. I, I learned how to bead on Nymo thread. And now I really dislike Nymo quite a bit. I think it's too shreddy. Um, it's just not my favorite. I would, uh, I like 1G quite a bit and I like KO thread quite a bit too. Uh, so you can use those kinds of threads for this project also. But in this case, I'm using the fire line. So I'm just going to ignore the fact that this is here, other than the fact that I know that I want to end up there when I add in this new thread. So I'm just going to kind of randomly pick a spot back here, and I'm going to pass through a couple of beads. So two, three, it doesn't really matter. I'm just kind of anchoring it. I'm leaving myself a short tail. I just need enough to hold on to so that as I'm weaving back and forth to get this new thread secured, I am not accidentally pulling it out. So I just need a little bit to hold on to. And then I'm not even going to tie knots to do this because square stitch is a beautiful stitch to weave back and forth and back on itself. So I went up three, I came down three, now I'm going to go back up two beads. I'm just literally kind of making this up as I go along. Going down two, I'm going to come out the end on this particular one. I'm going to give it a little tug and you're going to, when I give that a tug, you're going to feel that there is no movement there whatsoever. So now I'm actually, that's all I had to do was kind of create that little circle there. And now I'm going to move my uh, thread. I'm going to start working it over so that I can have it come out right where the old thread is, which means I need to kind of come up by three beads over here. This is the row previous to where my thread was coming out. And now I can come back down one bead. And now I've got both those threads coming out of the same bead. So now I can park this one. I can just kind of put it off to the side. I can cut off this little tail because I don't want to forget and accidentally think that I need to weave that in and go, oh my God, I left myself a tiny tail. And then I'm going to end off my old thread the same way where I'm just weaving around to secure it. So we're coming out of this bead here. Let's pop up through these three next to it. 
we can come down a couple, let's come down four. Let's come back up to and then come down to and that is literally all you need to do. You do need to watch out for any hooked threads. Did I hook a thread there? Nope, didn't hook. And then I can just snip this off. And I'm good to start moving forward again. And I'm in the perfect position to add my next loop of beads. And that's it. That's, you're just gonna be adding loops to the rest of your project, watching for those hooked threads. And when you're done, I guarantee you by the time you're done, you're gonna already have planned like five more variations that you wanna make. These treasure bracelets are so addictive. It's just ridiculous. As a matter of fact, this was, <laughs> funny story here. This was the first thing that I taught my mom how to make. So it was her very first bead weaving project. And uh, she resisted for quite a while. Like I'm gonna say like two years, maybe even three years as I was beading. She was just like, oh, that it's all those tiny beads. It's tedious. I'm never gonna like that. I don't have the patience for it. And then I think I was getting ready for, for um, a, this was back when I was still selling my jewelry. So I was getting ready to make, I was trying to make a bunch of uh, bracelets for a show that I was doing and I needed help. And so I taught her how to do this. And y'all, I am not even kidding. For the next six months straight, all she did was make treasure bracelets. <laughs> I couldn't get her to learn anything else because all she wanted to do was make these treasure bracelets. Um, she probably made 30 or 40 of them in that time frame. It's be because it really is addictive. You can't wait to see what it's going to look like with the next kind of bead and the next kind of bead and the color combos that you can put together. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it as much as my mom did <laughs> and probably still would. I think it's, um, it's just a really good solid basic bracelet to have in your repertoire. So um, it's something that once you have made a couple of them, you won't even have to think about the directions or anything. It's just an automatic uh, bracelet for you. It's kind of like those basic recipes for cooking. Um, this, I think, is a classic that everybody will always love. Now, don't forget that I do have a free PDF download for this project. And what I have done with the Mix It Up instructions on my free patterns page is I've added in information about all these, vari all these variations. So now the Mix It Up is called a Mix It Up Treasure Bracelet. Um, and it includes all sorts of variation information in there as well. So go get that free PDF download. I've got kits available. If you want me to put all those color combos together for you, I have done so. And you can find those at jillwisemandesigns.com. Happy beating. Thank you.